Uh, my name is Gant Laborde with Iconoclast Labs. I do the motion meetup uh, just about every month, sometimes less. And uh, <laughs> we have a good old time, and I've been fortunate enough to be asked to help uh, lead the panel today. We have some amazing people. The uh, category is Ruby Motion in Production. So if you have any questions about uh, your particular apps in production, we have a great set of people here. We have uh, Ryan Romanchuk from uh, Front back. We have Daniel Dickerson from uh, did I do that right? Close enough. Uh, <laughs> from um, Bandcamp, and this guy nobody knows who he is. Colin Gray, everybody. Right. So we have Colin Gray, uh, and he's going to be representing Jukely today. And so we have some questions now. The great part about this is that you guys get to come up and ask your questions as well. We're going to go ahead and seed some questions to start it off. But if you have a question. Please line up right over there on the left side. We'll form a line, and then, or you know, any way you want to, and we'll divide the questions out to you as we see fit. Which means, if Todd comes up here, we'll ignore him. It's fun. It's dig on Todd. Todd Day. All right, guys. So what I'd like to do is I'd like for each of you to introduce yourselves formally, talk a little bit about your app, so that everybody knows. We might not have used each of these applications. So if you don't mind. Alan Gray, and I am the community, man community manager at HipBite. When that role comes up, it's kind of ad hoc and uh, here and there. My full-time job is at Jukely. It's a startup based in New York City. Uh, we've built a music application and music promotion platform. So uh, we link up local live shows with people who love music, and hopefully we give them music that they're interested in. Uh, I think the tagline is, it's like a... Uh, a mixtape made by your stalker. So we really try, we use your, <laughs> we aggregate uh, Facebook information, um, SoundCloud, let's see, your iTunes music, um, lots of different music sources, Spotify, RDO, and we take all those uh, likes and favorites, put them into our, our algorithm, and then deliver recommendations back to you. Hello, I'm Daniel Dickinson. Uh, I work for Bandcamp, uh, which is uh, music, also music, a lot of music, I guess. Um, uh, online uh, service for uh, artists to sell music, uh, digital music online. And um, the app, the first version of the app was basically to, um, basically a way to listen to your purchased music, uh, you know, on the go. And since then, we've been um, slowly adding more uh, discovery features. Uh, you can follow artists and other fans. And you know, see what they're listening to, see what they're buying, and uh, check it out. So, it's the Bandcamp app, and yeah. Luckily, we're not going to play that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ryan Romanchuk. I'm an iOS developer at uh, Frontback, and we are a photo sharing app that is you and what you see, much like the name suggests. Uh, you're able to take uh, two photos with both camera devices, or two fronts or two backs, and it's two photos on top of each other. Yeah. Excellent. You can all right, so I'm going to go ahead and start with the first question here. Um, th basically, to start, what made you choose uh, your production app to be in Ruby Motion over any other possibility that was out there? Yeah, so the origin story of Frontpack is interesting. Uh, I was in Russia for the last two years uh, doing iOS Objective-C um, app for a company there called Astorok.ru. And uh, Frontpack was basically another company, a consumer web company called Check This. And they basically were out of money. They were uh, Rails developers, and uh, they started working on a fun little app, which is now today's Frontback. And if it wasn't for Ruby Motion, Frontback would not be where it is today. So I was able to really save, uh, you know, save that company. Nice. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I had done, you know, personally, I had done some Objective C and iOS development before, but um, the rest of the Bandcamp uh, guys are all familiar with Ruby. So um, you know, that was like really the driving uh, reason for uh, you know using Ruby Motion to write the app. Um, Michael Beaver, who's over there, he's another Bandcamper, but uh, you know, so he was able to come on to the iOS project um, sort of after the initial release and you know just kind of get up to speed real quickly because uh, you know a lot of the code is just straight Ruby. So that's, yeah, that's a big reason. So I'll answer this in two ways, because I <laughs> came onto the app later. Uh, Bora Selleck is the creator of the app and uh, founder of Jukely. 
And he chose it because he had had a long history of Java and before that Microsoft development. And he knew that he wanted to do a startup. He wanted to do an iOS app. Uh, he had a Jukli idea. Uh, him and the, uh, one of the original Kickstarter designers, Andrew Cornett, got together. Uh, Cornett? Cornett? I hope he doesn't watch this. Um, and they chose Ruby Motion because, again, of the ability to write in Ruby. He wanted to enjoy this startup that he was creating. Um, so he created the app. It took him about three months and to, to release the first version. Then they contacted me because of my activity in Ruby Motion, uh, asked me to help them out with some bugs. And I said, well, I'm actually already working full time uh, in other capacities. And about six months later, he said, OK, hey, how about an offer? And, and at that time, I was like, OK, yeah, I would love to do Ruby Motion full time. Nice. Yeah. yeah, all right. So to dig a little bit deeper, let's go a little bit further in. Now we know a bit about it. Uh, which gems and Cocoa Pods are you using in these production apps? Well. <laughs> we, we, we care. Yeah. Um, so actually, in Jukli, uh, they start, I inherited the app. And so they weren't using many gems at all at that time. Uh, I brought in SugarCube because I don't know how to code. <laughs> I don't know how to write <laughs> iOS code. <laughs> I just write SugarCube. Um, so of course, I'm the maintainer of SugarCube. So there's that inside joke. They, did, they do use a lot of Cocoa Pods, um, AF networking. Um, mm. and I'm not going to remember them all. Uh, reachability, mix panel. Um, I've played with Firebase for remote logging. Um, gosh, I'd have to pull up my rake file. I don't keep things in memory very long. And let's see here. Uh, as we've developed, I've brought in a lot more gems. So uh, I am starting to build uh, the UI and motion kit now. And I think that's the majority of them. Oh, and bubble wrap. Oh, well. um, yeah, we, we also uh, you know, didn't use a whole lot of gems and libraries. Um, well, uh, part, part of it was uh, we started development pretty early on and uh, you know, it wasn't clear at the time which gems would become sort of uh, you know, stable and uh, a long-term thing. Um, but we, you know, we wrote a lot of utility stuff in-house also, like you know, some utility things to do, auto layout constraints and things like that. Um, but yeah, we do, we, we do use some um, libraries, you know, just pulling in source files from GitHub and putting it in the vendor's directory kind of old school way, like FMDB if we're doing SQLite uh, accesses. Um, I think we use uh, TM Disk Cache, which is, um, I think, Tumblr's caching uh, library, uh, and a few other ones for reachability. I mean, reachability, yeah. everyone uses that. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah, but uh, yeah, even now, we don't have a whole lot of gems uh, pulled in, which, you know, I think probably will change uh, after learning about a lot of libraries here, you know, so um, we'll see. Yeah, we use very few. Um, we use, basically, we cherry pick the things that we really need. So like SureQ, we cherry pick the localization. Bubble Wrap, we're using just the location. Just makes it a little bit cleaner. Uh, the only DSL we're using is Clay's uh, AF Motion for AF networking, which makes uh, much nicer. Um, we're using SE Web Image for our image caching. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, AF networking, the usual suspects, but uh, that's about it. Gotcha. Excellent. So uh, as far as all the different setups, what's the exact business model? You know, especially interested with front back and, and some of these other items. What, what's the, uh, the idea here? Are you going after the user base? Uh, what's the financial roadmap? Well, uh, I mean, the photo sharing space is a huge risk. Uh, you know, the only way to win is to win the entire market. So it's all or nothing. It's like we're, we're not, you know, we're going to kill Instagram or we're not. And if Ruby Motion is going to hopefully help us get there. Uh, yeah, for us, I guess, you know, we already had a, you know, established business sort of. So, um, you know, it's, it is a little bit unfortunate that we can't sell music directly through the app because of, uh, you know, the Apple restriction. Um, but yeah, you know, people go on, on the web to buy the music and then, you know, just having a new way to listen to it easily without having to import music through iTunes, which is a pain in the butt. So that's you know just adding extra uh, usability, really. So yeah, in Jukli, we have a couple revenue streams. Uh, we sell tickets through the app. So you, um, it is you're scrolling along, you've gotten a recommendation, you open that up, you can listen to it on the app. And um, 
actually does a, a fun thing. If you let it just play from person to person, we use the speech synthesizer to say the artist's name and the date. So you can like hear beforehand, oh, I, I dig this. And you can open it up, buy the ticket right there in the app. And then the other part is the marketing aspect. So we are bringing artists to customers. I think there's value in that. Um, and so we, we get some, I uh, actually don't know how much I'm allowed to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> but that is, that's, uh, obviously there's revenue to be made from that. Very nice. And then so actually I see we had an audience question from a gentleman who's gonna be talking about marketing today, Mark Rickard. Hey guys, so I know like when you have an app in production, like things don't always go the way that they went on your simulator or <laughs> on your device. And so there's inevitably problems that, that that like rear their ugly head in production. Uh, can you guys talk about how you handle those things? Maybe services you use. I know you mentioned Mixpanel for analytics, but what about like like crashes in production? Like how do you guys track those and handle those errors? So yeah, uh, we also use Hockey App, and I highly recommend Hockey App. Uh, there's lots of bug reporting tools, and I've actually had some success with. As far as setting up, I've set up Test Flight and Criticism and Hockey App. I like all three. We're using Hockey App, and it's working very well for us. Um, we, I also use, yeah, I actually use kind of three logging, so Hockey App on a crash, Mixed Panel for user interaction and user behavior, and then I also use, um, only in development, I use Firebase to send logging events, and it's very verbose, so it's like this streaming log of every request and kind of everything. Um, so that's my noisy developer log, but um, let's see. Also, a lot of fixes have happened by having an API that is catering to iOS. So what I mean is our, our API is obviously consumed by the web service as well, uh, but we can change the web service very quickly. So we'll, if we find out that data is being expected on iPhone and that's not coming from the API, we'll rework the API to accommodate that and then rework the web service to accommodate that, just because we can do those two things instantly. Um, you can go really far down that road, too. I've heard of people having their, all their UI serve from the web. So you have a version on the device, but then it can get refreshes from servers. Uh, that seems like some voodoo to me, but <laughs> it can be done. Yeah, uh, yeah, crash reporting is a good one, because uh, you know, in, in theory, you can go to iTunes Connect and can see crash reports there, but most crashes don't actually show up. So if, um, we ended up just using a PL crash reporter, um, which uh, is just a client side thing that dumps out a crash log locally, and then we just upload it to our server on the next launch. Um, and we track it that way, which is you know it's okay. It's kind of a pain to uh, symbolicate after the fact, but um, you know, at least we do get a sense of the frequency of the crashing. Um, and there's definitely things that crash only very infrequently, like especially with concurrency related things. So it's, it's good to actually uh, you know, get a hard count of the number of crashes that are happening, which you just won't see in you know, low, uh, beta testing. Um, yeah, and also for uh, general event logging, uh, uh, you know, we, again, we, we kind of queue them up on, on the app and then send them to our server where we have, um, you know, we, have we, also, we already had various ways we're tracking stats on the site. So um, we kind of tie into that, have a new stream of data that's coming in uh, just directly. Yeah, pretty much a lot of the same. Uh, we have a large dedicated beta, uh, beta testing group on Hockey App uh, through our enterprise certificate. So we try to get hundreds and hundreds of people downloading and uh, we can catch the crashes um, on Hockey App. Uh, for non, for events that I want to know about that aren't, that don't want to cause a crash, I send to Google Analytics because our mix panel bill is already way too high. Um, uh, the other tricky thing is uh, when you build a binary for Apple with your App Store certificate, you actually never get to run that binary on your own device. Um, so there are actually, t like, it's, you can really mess up and wrap some code around a production if block and not realize that have a bug in that uh, section. So like the best thing I do now is under the notes is to say, um, sometimes Apple will not test your app. So I say, please make sure the app launches. And that, <laughs> and so that, uh, that goes a long ways actually sometimes. <laughs> uh. 
might have to quote you on that. It's pretty, so there's a constant, Ruby motion underscore env, and you can have this kind of fork of code. So for instance, my Firebase logging only happens in development, so that's hockey app, simulator, and on device when I compile it. Um, anything in production doesn't go there. So yeah, if that's the other if block, you will never run that. Uh, you could compile your app for release. So mode e rake mode equal release, and that'll compile it for production. Um, yeah, that yeah, actually leads exactly. me into a really good statement. I have some insider trading information on you here, I know. Uh, one of the problems that I think people come across is that you'll have an app with more than one developer working on it. And then you'll have the issues, like how do you handle that? I know specifically you use a motion env, is that the gem? Or, or, oh, um, or do you just set up in your environment? No, I, I do in the rake file. I yeah, should I use motion env or something, but again, this is a situation where I kind of came on and right fixed what I needed to, uh, gotcha. to do what I wanted. So uh, what I do in my rake file, so there's uh, three people who, uh, actually four people now who will compile the app. Most of the time it's me, I'm the iOS developer, <laughs> but also the two founders, and then also our, our API guy. Um, so they'll, they'll compile it, and for each of them, basically I, I check the env user, and if it's Bora, then I, com I, s I do the settings for Bora, and he can change those. If it's Andrew, I do it for him. And then we have another version for hockey app and another version for release. So if it's in release mode, it goes down there. Um, so yeah, if you need to enable and disable things for you or for certain testers, things like that. So for instance, you could do A-B testing. Uh, there's a fun trick where you can go in your rake file, check for those settings. So this is during compile time. And then include a Ruby file, uh, either this one for one, you know, kind of like an A-B testing or you might generate a constants file and include that at compile time. And we do both of those. Yeah. There's another way you could do it also is uh, in the rake file you could set uh, uh, arbitrary keys in the info plist um, and then you can pull that out at runtime. So I think we do that for uh, uh, enabling test flight SDK stuff for test flight uh, builds. But I think we try to keep the test flight builds as close to the production release you know, settings as possible. So try to minimize uh, things that are uh, you know, just come out for the release build. Yeah. Also, if you're working on a team, uh, I strongly recommend you actually version version your Ruby Motion. So, like, if you have a new hire, uh, he could download the latest head when you're working on an older version, um, and that can cause a lot of issues. So, I check in if I'm running 2.28. I check it in, and everyone is forced to download and cache that version of Ruby Motion. Nice. You can specify a version at the top. I'm, I'm just loud, so I'm just like, this thing doesn't actually affect my. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and that reminded me of a, another thing, and I'm going to forget it. Oh, uh, tag your releases. Mm -hmm. So when you put out version 2.1.1, tag 2.1.1, because in your stack traces, sometimes they won't symbolicate right, and you'll get a, a you know, you'll just get all these memory addresses. And if you try really hard, you can symbolicate them on your machine. You can go, you can compile it for production, you can find that address, and you can use uh, A2S to like, get that line number. It's not easy, it's not enjoyable, but it's possible, and with some of these crashes, it will, it'll save you. But you must tag that release. Um, any small change in all those memory addresses are they're just all different. Gotcha, all right. It looks like uh, we should take another audience. Uh, how do you guys do your um, your builds? So, like, how frequently do you release a production build to the App Store? And when you do that, do you build it just by hand, or do you have that automated in any way? <laughs> He's thinking. Um, well, I mean, like, we have. Uh, so, I love to deploy bugs into production. My <laughs> my co-founder doesn't. Uh, so Hockey App is great for me because I'm pushing, if you have an enterprise certificate and you have users testing it uh, and who are always testing it, you can basically get a build out. I mean, sometimes I'll have a build five times a day. It'll be fix, oh, sorry, fix, oh, sorry, fix. Um, which, <laughs> uh, and then we just basically stay consistent. So if I'm, if I'm doing the App Store build, uh, I'll do the App Store build the next time as well. Um, I mean, we have, 
you know, there are those issues where configuration problems, but you can usually have a pretty clean rake file across environments, but it's just, it's more superstition than, than anything. I'd say for release builds, um, you know, we'll have a, a, a release with features, you know, that might take weeks or months to do, and then, you know, often right after the release we'll find some bugs, so they'll be, you know, within the course of a few days we'll submit another bug fix. But yeah, for uh, testing builds, um, yeah, it's usually, usually we try not to do more than one a day, maybe a couple a day, because I think, you know, <laughs> you, the, 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 yeah, the, you get tester fatigue, so um, yeah, but for release builds, it's, uh, you know, basically as soon as, if it's a bug fix build, you just submit it as soon as possible and just hope it gets reviewed quickly. Yeah, and there, there is a, a possibility that you can ask Apple to rush a build. They won't do it very much, so you can't abuse that feature, but if it is something that's like all, you know, your app, it, it's on the App Store, and if you open it, it immediately crashes, you can ask them to uh, really, you know, please rush this. And sometimes, you know, they will or won't honor that, especially if you just ask them before that, then they'll, they'll, it, you're, they're more likely to ignore you. Uh, so yeah, for builds, we also, um, I do all the code, and I never submit to the Apple Store. I'm not allowed anymore <laughs> um, <laughs> for the same reason. Um, so yeah, I build, I send it out, testing happens, and then that, you know, uh, Bora will submit it to the App Store. Um, use Hockey App, do have testing. Oh, we have a checklist that I <laughs> resend, and that's like me being a jerk, like whoever is testing, I want a star by all of these. I did open settings, I did do a filter, I did close it and verify that it did filter, you know, things like that. That's, we've broken that before, we've broken that before, we've broken that before, so we just, every time we break something, it gets added to the list, or of course, hopefully we've added things preemptively. Uh, and that checklist has helped us a lot. I think that's our yeah. like, best that's good. bug fixer. I'm a big uh, to-do list kind of guy anyway. Uh, so, I wanted to ask, um, besides writing tests, which is everybody's favorite part, um, what was your favorite part of writing the application? The, the iOS 7 transition, so actually, yeah. um, when Laurent showed Jukli, I like reeled in horror, because that was the <laughs> iOS 6 version, <laughs> and it's, uh, our designer is, he's awesome, he is so good, and he has such an eye for the iOS 7 mentality of content and context. And he, he just nailed it. If you've used Jukli, you, you might know what I'm talking about, but um, it, it's, this, it's an iOS 7 look and feel that's just like really enjoyable. Uh, so it has a lot of custom transitions, custom controller transitions, uh, and those were kind of a joy to code. Um, a lot of blurring and opacity, fade-ins that are just, you know, for me, I, I like to build myself as a, a UI and UX experience kind of person and building those out was a lot of fun. And I think iOS gives you a lot of really neat tools to, uh, to accomplish those. Yeah, and didn't it release, uh, iOS 7 was announced uh, right in the middle of all of that. I, mean, I think that they announced it and then it released in September, so you got caught right in the mix. We did, yeah, we kind of, we had to, we didn't have to rush iOS 7. We were really glad to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Andrew's the designer, and he was like, oh, this is going to be awesome, and we had a lot of fun building the designs, but it was also an entire app to update, so just as far as volume, it was quite a rush, but um, we wrote a lot of helpers, like the nav bar. We rewrote nav bar, so we have our own, you know, UI navigation bar-like item, but it's all of our own buttons, our own graphics, and kind of works our way, um, so yeah. Navbar is interesting. We had we had to write our own navbar too because <laughs> you know the built-in UI nav, navigation bar is really limited in customization. But uh, yeah, and I have to confess we're pretty bad about writing tests. So uh, you know we should we'll probably do <laughs> you know, what tests? Yeah. So that's something we probably do more of. But yeah, I guess like you know favorite part is uh, you know when you're working on individual pieces of the code, it's you know it can get frustrating. But it's when you see all the pieces you know finally come together like. You got your server side APIs, you know, working, and then you got the client side stuff working. You buy some music on the site and you launch the app and suddenly it shows up. It's you know, that's nice. the best part. I'm, I'm sure, you know, everyone that writes software can relate to that feeling. Yeah. And the angels sing. <laughs> I think one of the great things for me coming to Remotion was before this I was an iOS developer, Objective C, 
Mm -hmm. um, so when I first joined, I was like, oh, we're rewriting, we're rewriting, we're rewriting, we have to. Um, but I was actually pleasantly surprised about how compatible um, becoming, I mean, I was a Rails developer too, um, it was extremely compatible, like coming over to Remotion as an iOS developer. At first, it's a little like, where's my Xcode tool set? Where's my debugger? Where's my, I mean, where's the VMI? Now you have all of that, those tools. So um, even with like things like core data, will this even work in Remotion? Everything has worked, very, no, almost no problem. So it was great. Very cool. All right, we're going to go ahead and do a, probably our last audience question. Sorry, Todd. He has a back front question he's working on his own. All right, so my question is whenever Hip Python theme releases one of these like 30% increases or something, have you ever been guilty of just like bug fix releasing and just <laughs> by recompiling and you're like, aha, we did something <laughs> cool? <laughs> we should. <laughs> it's a great idea. Um, no, I think whenever they happen, uh, actually, I'm usually the first one to download it and test it and make, make sure it works. And I'm always in the middle of something. It's, he, he doesn't time it for me for some reason. Um, so yeah, I haven't, I haven't gotten to do that. But actually, when, when uh, RubyMotion 3.0 comes out, or which version are we on? 3.0. It'll be 3. Yeah. Uh, with uh, Watson's speed increases, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, by the time there's a new RubyMotion bug fix, we, we have plenty of bug fixes of our own, so there's always something. But um, it's actually kind of an interesting, uh, you know, with all the speed increases lately, um, there's one part that we did some profiling in that we kind of wrote in Objective-C um, because the Ruby motion, you know, dispatch and string manipulation was just kind of slowing it down, which is the, the searching through your collection feature, which does some fuzzy matching. So a lot of string operations in a tight loop. So, um, you know, I'd be curious to see, you know, with all these speed increases, if we just go back to the pure Ruby version, maybe it's fast enough now. So there's, because it, you know, it's great that Ruby Motion lets you write Objective-C and seamlessly just call out to it. Um, really trivial to do, which is awesome. But uh, it would be great if we can just, uh, you know, as much as possible keep it in the Ruby world. Yeah, and we support, like, over 30 languages, so our language file, our strings are always updating. So. We, we love to, I love to have an excuse to get uh, a new version out as soon as possible. And another pro tip is don't actually write updates in your update field. Write something funny. We have a competition to see how, how many tweets we can get from our ridiculous ah. uh, status. I mean, Apple, Apple doesn't care. Marketing about. tip. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, so uh, it seems we're running out of time. So one of the things I want to do is I want to ask one last question. Um, with the announcement of Ruby Motion 3 with uh, the BlackBerry support, <laughs> I mean Android support, what, what do you see, how do you see this working uh, for your application moving forward? Are you going to jump straight into using it on the Android side? Are you just going to kind of test it out? What's your plans? Well, uh, unfortunately, we already have uh, the Android <laughs> version, you know, out already. So, um, you know, if this was like a year ago, it would have been awesome. We probably would have been writing the Android app in Ruby Motion too, but, uh, you know, maybe, who knows, maybe, uh, I mean, I think we'll definitely play with it, so um, it'll be interesting to see that. Uh, so yeah, I actually had a really hard time because I couldn't, didn't, it didn't feel right to tell my, my coworkers <laughs> that Android support was coming. You know, I was on strict, like, you know, no one is told this. <laughs> so they're asking me, hey, we want to do an Android app, would you be willing to do that? And I'm like, yes. Great. How, how's your Java? I'm like, okay. Maybe we could use Roboto. And of course, I'm, I'm saying we should use Roboto. And I'm knowing, you know, it's got the startup time issue. It makes big files. But I don't have to tell them that. But they'll figure it out quickly because of the startup issue. And luckily, at one point, they said, "Hey, real sorry, but we're gonna we're gonna have to put that off for many months." And I was like, "Oh, bummer." <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, you know, today happened, I'm like, oh, I'm in the clear. Yay, so <laughs> go team Jukely, we'll be writing our Android app in Ruby Motion. Yeah, we already crossed that bridge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we needed Android out and um, just bad timing. So we have, you know, uh, a great Android developer we're already down the road, but it'd be, I'm excited to actually uh, play with it myself. 
Gotcha. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, the, I'm sure these gentlemen, let's give them a round of applause. They did a great job. I, I see we didn't get to the end of the uh, questions here, but I'm sure these guys will be around, right? So thank you, everybody.